Welcome. Welcome to the inaugural session of, uh, of Harvard Law School's series on policing in America. I'd like to start by thanking Dean Manning and the Harvard Law School staff for making this series possible. Uh, you can't see her, but we all owe a special thank you to Jenna Cowie, who is our faculty assistant and who has uh, put in an enormous number of hours to make sure that this uh, that the session was possible and able to run smoothly. So thank you, Jenna. This is a year long series. We are committed to having this conversation uh, uh, over the series of the entire year. Next next month session will be on police accountability and the issue, uh, the highly contested issue of qualified immunity. The session after that uh, uh, in November will be on police unions. Uh, I will not go through every session, although I am excited about every single one of them, uh, and they're all fabulous with wonderful panelists and participants. I encourage you, though, to, to go to the website Policing in America. Dot law, uh, at dot harvard edu, which has information on all our future sessions, our future panelists, and additional resources for those of you who would like to read more deeply about these subjects, uh, both regarding this session and future sessions. I've been, um, uh, my name is Professor Alexandra Nadipoff. <laughs> I teach criminal law and criminal procedure uh, here at Harvard Law School. Uh, before I entered the academy, I was an assistant federal public defender in Baltimore, Maryland. I have been looking forward very much to this series, to this, this set of conversations, uh, and, I, and I'll start by saying that I am very optimistic, and I am very worried. Uh, I am optimistic because such a broad and deep range of people have and are now speaking out against the injustices of our criminal system. I am I'm optimistic and moved because of the bravery, because so many people are stepping up with incredible bravery and putting their bodies and their lives and their careers on the line to insist that our criminal system be better. And I am worried because political momentum dissipates because meaningful change is and has always been so difficult to achieve and sustain in this arena. 10 years ago, as perhaps you all recall, we had a solid bipartisan consensus that mass incarceration was a terrible idea. It's expensive, we all agreed. It's racist, it's ineffectual. And yet today, a decade later, we still practice mass incarceration. We still rely on our criminal system as a go-to response to our social problems, to our problems of inequality. As a nation, we still overuse the criminal system as a form of governance to a greater degree and in a harsher manner than any other nation. And so until we rethink those historical and political and economic choices, I am worried that extraordinary moments like this one and the sacrifices that so many people are making in this moment may not bring the kinds of structural changes that we hope for. And so I am looking forward very much to this panel, to our extraordinary experts uh, on this panel to help us understand the depths and complexities of these challenges and also where we might go from here. Uh, I am going to turn this session over now to, to my co-host, Professor Crespo, who will introduce our speakers. We will hear opening remarks from each of our panelists. Uh, as moderators, Professor Crespo and I will then pose some questions to each of them to get the dialogue going. And then we will look to the audience for questions. Please, if you have questions that you would like to pose to the panel, submit them through the Q&A function in written form. Professor Crespo. Thank you so much, Professor Nadipov. Uh, I echo Professor Nadipov's thanks to our dean, to our school, and to all of the staff here at Harvard Law School who made this something that we could uh, pull off. Uh, for both Professor Nadipov and I, I think that this series is a professional and a personal passion project. Uh, professionally, the two of us have each spent our academic careers teaching and writing about the police and about the law of policing. 
before becoming academics, the two of us were each public defenders. I think between the two of us, we've probably represented hundreds of people, uh, all of them poor, because that's what public defenders do. They represent people who can't afford a lawyer. And thinking of my clients, overwhelmingly people of color, almost universally people of color. We represented them in their encounters with the American penal system. And for each of them, those encounters started with an encounter with policing in America. Personally, I'll, I'll just add that, you know, in my heart, I teach at Harvard Law School, but I'm a New Yorker. Uh, I'm a New Yorker from a big extended Puerto Rican family. And in that family, there are multiple people stretching over decades who have been harassed by the police. There are multiple people who have been arrested by the police. And there are multiple people who are police officers. Uh, and I love all of them. <laughs> from these professional and personal perspectives, I come to this space seeing it as a space in which there are in fact some clear right and wrong answers and some clear and deep and long-standing systemic injustices that have stood for way, way too long. And then I also see it as a space marked by some real complexity and some nuance with hard problems to solve. So I just feel so incredibly fortunate that our school has committed to spending a full year discussing these questions. I feel especially fortunate to be joined by Professor Nadapoff in that project and in the work. And I think most of all, I feel fortunate about the amazing people who are joining us over this year in these seven series, these seven lectures, as just such incredible guests with such range of perspective and expertise and voice to bring to, uh, to, bring to this discussion. So it's a real privilege to introduce to you our kickoff panel. I'm gonna uh, introduce each of them, uh, starting with Cori Bush. Cori Bush is a nurse, a pastor, a former early childhood educator, and ever since the killing of Michael Brown in 2014 in her hometown of Ferguson, Missouri, she has been an activist and one of the leading voices in the Black Lives Matter movement on issues of police reform. This past August, she defeated Congressman Lacey Clay in the Democratic primary for Missouri's first district, which includes Ferguson and St. Louis. It is a heavily Democratic district, so it is safe to say that Ms. Bush joins us as the presumptive next representative from the first district of Missouri. So if I slip over the next hour and a half and call you Congresswoman Bush, uh, please uh, consider me prescient and not uh, uh, necessarily inaccurate. Uh, come January 3rd, Ms. Bush is likely to be the first black woman to ever represent the state of Missouri in the US Congress. I'm going to introduce uh, a panelist we don't yet have on with us, which is our own district attorney, Rachel Rollins. DA Rollins had a last minute change in her schedule due to the unfortunate and surprising passing of our Chief Justice here in Massachusetts, the late Chief Justice Gans. And I should just pause for a moment and say that Chief Justice Gans is someone who those of us in Massachusetts knew well, uh, who was a champion of racial justice in our state and someone who I think many people uh, miss and are, and are grieving right now. And DA Rollins is right now speaking to her staff about the passing of Chief Justice Gantz. And we hope that she'll be able to join us soon. I'm gonna introduce her now so that when she joins us, she can just pop right in. To those of us here in Massachusetts, Rachel Rollins is a familiar face. She serves as the district attorney for Suffolk County, which includes the entire city of Boston. She is the first woman to hold that office and the first woman of color to serve as a district attorney anywhere in the state. She was elected in 2018 on a progressive prosecution platform. And since then, her office has, among other things, published the now famous in these circles, Rollins Memo, which among other things, outlined her plans to decriminalize certain low level offenses by simply refusing to prosecute them. A month later, she sued the Federal Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, more commonly known as ICE. She sued them in federal court to try to block them from arresting immigrants in Massachusetts courthouses. And one week from today, she has promised to release her office's so-called Brady List. This is an internal document that pretty much every prosecutor's office in the country has, cataloging police officers known to the prosecutor's office to have misconduct issues. Usually those lists are kept secret. DA Rollins has promised that hers will be released to the public one week from today. Next on our panel is Rachel Harmon, who is one of the country's leading scholars of policing and of the laws that govern police behavior. She is a professor of law at the University of Virginia Law School, where she directs that school's Center for Criminal Justice. She's a member of the American Law Institute, where she serves as an associate reporter for the forthcoming Principles on the Law of Policing. 
She's also the author of a first of its kind case book entitled The Law of the Police, which is due out next year. A former law clerk to Judge Guido Calabresi and Justice Stephen Breyer, Professor Harmon worked for eight years as a federal prosecutor in the criminal section of the DOJ's Civil Rights Division, where her responsibilities included investigating, investigating and prosecuting police misconduct. Finally, Professor Priscilla Ochen is a professor of law at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles and a scholar of criminal law and critical race theory. She's an expert voice on many topics, including most especially the way that race, gender, and class interact to render women of color vulnerable to various forms of violence and criminalization. In addition to authoring numerous articles on this topic, she's the co-author of an influential policy report called Black Girls Matter, Pushed Out, Over-Policed, and Underprotected. Before becoming an academic, Professor O'Chen served as a law clerk to Judge Eric Clay on the Sixth Circuit and as a Thurgood Marshall Fellow with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law in San Francisco. She currently serves on the Oversight Commission for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Oversight. Thank you all so much for being here and welcome. It's wonderful to see you and it's wonderful to have you. To start off our discussion, we'd like to invite each of you to share some opening remarks in the order of five to 10 minutes that help us all understand the challenge of policing in America today. What should we as a country learn from the killing of George Floyd and so many others? How should we understand the summer of protests that followed in their wake? And where should we be taking our penal system and our institutions of policing from here? Uh, I'm slipping already. Congresswoman Bush, if you could start us off. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for this invite and this platform to be able to share, um, especially from the standpoint of um, someone who is uh, an act came into this as just an activist, but not even an activist first, just someone who just wanted to see what was happening in her community. Uh, so let me just start with when, um, before I ever stepped foot um, at a protest, um, standing up for Black Lives Matter, for me, I was just a, um, you know, I was, I always saw myself as just this black woman trying to survive in, in America and trying to raise two children and wanting to keep my son alive. That was just the way that I, you know, that's how I walked through life. Um, and um, I was a registered nurse, uh, became a pastor and uh, opened a church. And I thought that my work was kind of capped at uh, after working in early childhood for 10 years, I felt that my work was um, working, um, of course, as a nurse, but then working with the unhoused population in our community, working with um, helping uh, fight human trafficking. You know, I felt like that was my thing um, and then pastoring my church. But it was when Michael Brown was murdered in 2014 that I saw something that I never thought I would see in my own community. Uh, you know, I remember the day that he was murdered, I just kept seeing his photo uh, across my uh, feed and my, on my social media. Didn't even pay much attention, just saw this body laying, you know, face down um, and uh, uncovered this body just laying on the ground. And it took a while before, it's a few times that I saw it, I kept scrolling and I kept seeing it, you know, over the course of the day, still not, re not realizing that was happening in our own community. Then once I found out that it was in Ferguson, which was just six, six minutes from my home, that's when I realized that I could do something. So I decided, show up. You know, I didn't know what I could do. I just saw people congregating. I didn't know what, to, you know, I'm, I'm, but I was thinking, hey, I'm clergy. I'm a nurse. I can go out and be a medic. I can just offer support. I can pray with people. So that's what I did. Um, what I saw, though, when I stepped onto the ground in that community, something that looked like civil rights footage from the 60s, that I never thought I'd see in my own day. I grew up in a household. My dad's been in politics for most of my life. He was the kind of father, he wouldn't allow me to put, you know, at that time, people may not remember, but it was like uh, Barbie, strawberry shortcake, cabbage patch kids, gym. You know, I couldn't have that on my wall as a kid. You know, I had the great kings and queens of Africa on the wall as a kid, you know, like my dad, I had, you know, Rosa Parks and Dr. King and like, that's what he, I had Jesse Jackson, you know, um, you know, uh, Jesse Jackson, 84 or something on the wall. Like that's what was that, that's who 
my dad was, but he wanted me to learn that my skin color was okay, that my skin color was, was, you know, that I had to love it and, but society would not love it. And so he was building me up. What I didn't realize that through that teaching, um, that would, it would later sprout out into something that I could use later. And so, you know, um, one thing that, but, you know, looking at what we were taught, we were taught, so many of us anyway, were taught, you know, if you go to school, if you do well, go to school, you know, get good grades, you know, go to a good high school, get into a good college, get you a scholarship, you know, uh, go in and uh, get you a good job, travel, and then have kids, get the, you know, get the spouse and the picket fence, the White House, all of that great stuff, whatever the color of the house is, the white picket fence, a couple dogs. We were taught that this is what was achievable for us. Like, like now you, you can sit at the front of the bus, like you're good now, you know, you have arrived. But what we didn't learn was that the police was still killing us. You know, and the, I remember uh, as a child, my dad was in politics, but I remember every time we stepped outside of our small municipality where he was no longer an elected official, he would get pulled over by the police at least once a week. And I'm, that's, not, that's not even an exaggeration. He would get pulled over by the police so much. I used to be angry when I had to ride with him in the car because I didn't want to see what happened every time he was pulled over by the police. And I used to just think, boy, why are you such a bad driver? Like, why won't you do better? That was my thought process as a child. I just didn't understand it even as a teenager why won't you do better as an early teen why won't you do better it wasn't until I got a little older and I started to see now my friends are driving and how much they were getting pulled over by the police but it still didn't compute I grew up in a, in a household with a politician the police were in and out of my home all the time so for, to me maybe something was wrong maybe we're doing something wrong is what I you know what I was fighting with that but when Michael Brown was murdered and I'm out there on the streets in, in six minutes from my home where my nail salon was on one side of the street, the place where I would go and the place where I would get my hair done was on the other side of the street. This was my community. When I hit the ground and I saw the police in riot gear, I saw MRAPs, I saw uh, dogs, and I saw thousands of people in the street. I couldn't believe my eyes because this is my neighborhood. Nobody said this was coming. And not only that, how do we, we are we prepared for this? I remember as we started to get the, the, we started to hear about how we were protesting wrong. And I just remember pushing back on that all the time. You're telling us we're protesting wrong, but first of all, you should have fixed it before you want to come, before you, you decided to come tell us that we're doing it wrong because we're only doing it because, the, because there is a need, because somebody was murdered and not only him, but so many others. In the course of us protesting, more were murdered. So instead of telling us that we're doing it wrong, you should have fixed it first. But because you didn't fix it and because there is no playbook, there was no playbook the day before Michael Brown was murdered that said, this is how you protest. This is, this is what you do if you are a nurse. This is what you do when you, go, when you hit the ground. If you are a chef, this is what you do when you hit the ground. If you're a this, this is what you do. You're, if you're, that, there was no playbook. And so we did what we felt we needed to do in that moment. And then there was this split, um, whether it was, uh, you know, generational or, cl or clergy, you know, it was just so many splits because everybody was just showing up doing what they thought was right. Our politicians were doing what they thought was right. And it tore up a community. But even though it started to tear up a community, we f the ripple effect of what was happening in Ferguson, in the St. Louis area, started to move across the country and the world. What we learned when we think about uh, George Floyd's murder, first of all, is that as much as we've protested, as much as we've organized and we've pushed, these things continue to happen. What we've learned is when the police wanted to, when, when our government wants to tell us, we need to throw some more money at it to fix it. We've seen that when you throw, when money was thrown at it in Minnesota, George Floyd was still murdered with a knee on his neck. You know, and so we threw money at it and said, we're going to give 12, the, gov the governor $12 million to help, you know, with, you know, uh, with police training. And is that the police training that came out of that? This is what you do. You put a knee on someone's neck. So, so for us, throwing money at it is not the solution. Um, when we think about the, when we think about what you call the summer of protest, that summer of protest to me, it was 
different than what I remember in 2014 with Michael Brown in 2014 because we protested more than 400 days, even though the media stopped look, stopped uh, covering it. Um, and we protested again in 2017 after the uh, verdict. Uh, Jason Stockley was, um, that man should have gone to jail for what he did to Anthony Lamar Slip Smith, but um, we protested then. Uh, still, un it's just a lot of brutality, a lot of um, excessive force against protesters. What we've seen this time is that what we fought for, just being able to say Black Lives Matter now, it's a fad. It's this thing. Oh, yeah, Black Lives Matter. We, think, we still can't get our police to say it, but the corporations can say it and make money off of it. The police won't say it. Someone said to me recently, they said, you know, well, when a police officer is murdered, why don't we see Black Lives Matter get up and say, you know, like, and denounce this and say, oh, that's a horrible thing. And what I said to them was, when do the police get up and say, when do all the police departments get up and, and go on television and say, you know what, another life was taken. And so we denounce that, that action. So stop telling people who are volunteers to this movement that are just trying to fix a problem that, was, that, that has been going on for so long, for decades. And actually, the real problem has been going on for centuries. Stop telling us how to fix it when, you're the, when you are the problem. Um, what we saw this summer was we saw people from all walks of life. We saw it in Ferguson, but even the more, even the more now, we saw people from all walks of life, any age group, um, ableism is out the door, ageism is out the door. Everybody was showing up, fighting in the streets. And we weren't just saying a, a black man's name. We were saying black women's names as well. That's important because black women are dying too. Black children are dying. So we were hearing those names being said. Um, and I just, I'm looking forward to what we're able to do now, um, you know, where we're taking this, we're talking about defunding the police and making it very clear what we, what we mean by defund. The reformist conversations, the abolish um, the police uh, conversations are all important right now. So it's up to us to figure out how to get there. And so when we take regular people like me and put them with academics and put them with other people from, the com um, from different walks of life in the community, that's how we're going to get somewhere with this. And so, you know, I'm thankful to be on this panel with everyone. And uh, I can't wait to see what comes out of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I see that we are uh, joined uh, at least virtually by DA Rollins as she gets set up uh, and, uh, and plugged into Zoom. We'll really uh, look forward to hearing from her, but I think we're gonna turn right now to Professor, uh, to Professor Harmon. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel. But before I talk about policing in America today, I want to ask you a question that follows up on what Sasha mentioned. Sasha said that despite agreement about mass incarceration, we haven't done enough to fix it. But you might ask, what's so wrong with mass incarceration? I mean, overwhelmingly, people in prison today are guilty of the crimes they committed. Most of those crimes are mm, pretty serious. And many people think that punishing people for crimes by sending them to prison is a legitimate thing to do. So in some sense, it should be a little surprising that actually Americans overwhelmingly agree that far too many people are in prison and that reforms should continue to bring those numbers down. The answer to that question helps us see, answer the question that uh, Andrew asked at the beginning, which is what's new in the conversations about policing today? What's new in the protests? But let me s step back one step further and say, before we talk about what's new, let's talk about what isn't new. Um, uh, Congressman, Bush brought up some of the issues that are not new. There is a long-standing concern that officers engage in unnecessary over-policing and violence, especially against racial minorities, and that there's an absence of meaningful legal remedies for misconduct. So one journalist described it this way, talking about officers in New York, it's not seldom that a peaceful citizen meets a front at the hands of a policeman. Too often, an officer sees a need for his interference where none exists. And nearly as often, he's impolite or even insulting in his manners. The journalist goes on to talk about whether a person treated this way should resist or disobey and says not unless he's utterly bereft of sense, because doing so is going to result in physical damage and not to the policeman either. That article was published this week, 122 years ago in the New York Tribune, 1898. You will hear in today's protests, in the reform efforts, in contemporary talk about policing, this age-old concern that policing is racist, that it's violent, and that it's arbitrary because the law is too permissive, that police nevertheless break that law, and when they do, they're not really held accountable, or at least not often enough. 
Now, I don't want to suggest that those complaints have gone away. I think they're clearly there or that contemporary reform efforts aren't designed to mitigate them. But I've been working on policing issues for more than 20 years, and it seems to me there is something new in today's protests and in the conversations about police. There's a growing concern that's not about the precise shape of the law governing the police or whether a specific incident complied with or broke the law, but an argument that it doesn't matter. That even accepting that police is necessary and useful to promote public safety or bring offenders to justice, and even assuming that most of the damage the police do in the name of those goals is legal, that policing's harms have just as a whole gone too far in light of its benefits especially for individuals and communities who pay most of the costs. And that's in lives lost in, and also in humiliation suffered. And we're not just talking about people of color, we're talking about people with mental and phys physical disabilities, the youth, people with alcoholism and, and, homeless, and suffering from homelessness, LGBT community. The new theme that I hear in today's protests about policing is that policing's problem is like mass incarceration that whatever policing's benefits as a whole, it is doing too much harm. So you can see this in a whole variety of ways. I wanna mention three of them. First, you can see it in the swift and severe response of protesters to incidents of deadly force today. So if you look nearly 30 years ago when Rodney King, a 25 year old African-American father of two daughters was beaten by LAPD officers, LA burned with the worst urban riot in the 20th century. But that didn't happen until a year after the videos were first shown on TV, when the officers were acquitted in the state criminal trial. And you see that continuing, um, Congress member Bush just mentioned um, the, uh, Stockley, the officers involved in Stockley's death, uh, the acquittal there and the protests to which it led. But three months ago when Rayshard Brooks, who was a 27 year old African-American father of three daughters was killed in Atlanta, and a video showed his killing was released, demonstrators gathered within hours. And by the next day, the Wendy's restaurant near where he was burned was burned to, near where he was shot was burned to the ground. Now the officers involved in Brooks's death have been charged. By my reading of the facts and the law, I think that cross prosecution is going to have, be a serious uphill battle because the video shows Brooks resisting arrest, taking an officer, a taser from one of the officers and firing at another officer even though he's ultimately shot as he runs away. Um, given the video, you might read the immediate and angry presence of those protesters as saying in effect, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that his arrest was obviously illegal. It doesn't matter that he resisted it. It doesn't matter that he was caught on video grabbing an officer's weapon and turning it on the police. The new emphasis in the conversation today is that all of that is beside the point. It's enough that Brooks was one of too many black men whose death seems pointless and avoidable, making the shooting illegitimate whether or not it was illegal. You can also see this in the call for reforms. Now, many of the reforms we're gonna talk about um, today and in the course of the series, such as requiring independent prosecutors for police misconduct or eliminating qualified immunity are really contemporary versions of an effort we've been talking about for more than 100 years, which is strengthening whatever accountability mechanisms are available for individual officers. And those remain important. But I want to suggest that uh, Congress Member Bush, Bush's reference to the call to defund the police, that's a break with that tradition. And it's consistent with this new theme. Defunding the police, which usually means significantly cutting back the police department's budget, isn't a way to make police more accountable. And unlike abolition, it's not a way to get rid of the police. It's a way to make policing more harm efficient. The idea is that with reduced resources, police will be forced to limit coercive policing to circumstances in which it's most essential to achieving public safety, such as stopping ongoing uh, violence. And in the process, they'll give up practices like aggressive stops and frisks that impose mass harm in order to discover or deter crime. The funding advocates usually take this one step further by repurposing the funds from police departments to other less harmful methods of achieving public safety. And the idea there too, is that with the same money, we can achieve some of the same public safety benefits with less pain and more dignity than we do now. Now, whatever you believe about whether that defunding effort will work the way advocates imagine, you should hear in this idea, this new emphasis on harm efficiency over or in addition to officer accountability. 
Um, my last example is actually, uh, and I call it harm efficiency, but that's because I'm a professor. It, the, the demands for the community input in, in the past have often focused on civilian review, which is basically a way of making disciplinary proceedings more thorough, more accurate. Today's protesters want something different. They want to shift decision-making about policing to those who suffer its harms, rather than leave it with traditional political elites. And I think that's not just a demand for control, it's a, there's a more subtle message there that effectively we will only get policing that's worth its costs if we pay attention to those, what those costs are. And the only way to do that is actually to give voice to people who suffer them. The protests in this sense are themselves a way to make policing more efficient because they highlight the real harms of the police, the black and bum, brown bodies especially. And for Americans who don't experience those harms and could otherwise easily ignore them, the protests help them understand the full cost of policing, which may make them more likely to demand policing that minimize, minimizes those harms. Now, Maybe I'm reading too much into all this. That's possible. A few years ago, I wrote an article entitled Why Arrest? And I argued that even if all of the 10 million arrests conducted by the police each year were legal, they're unjustifiable because they're far too harmful. And as Brooks's death reminds us, as does George Floyd's, they're certainly a locus for violence. And it turns out we don't need them to protect the public or to start the criminal process. If arrests weren't just the automatic standard practice and we actually evaluated whether they were worth the harms they in, uh, impose, neither Brooks nor Floyd would be dead today. More broadly, I've argued elsewhere that policing, that every course of policing practice, whatever its legality, should be evaluated from this standpoint. It has to be necessary to achieve important goals, the harms have to be proportionate to the goals, and the harms have to be minimized and fairly distributed. So given that I've argued that in the past, I might be hearing too much in what's going on in today's protests, but I don't think so. I think that critics of policing today care deeply about the issues with which policing has long grappled, but there is this new emphasis that policing does too much harm more than it needs to get the job done. And actually, given the harms, not all the job is necessarily worth doing. Or to say it another way, that policing's problem is like mass incarceration. And if that's true, if the critics are right, then the public policy challenge we face is a little bit different than the one we faced before. Because taking our public safety goals seriously and maintaining a commitment to fairness and legality in individual encounters, we still have to think anew beyond accountability to ways to ensure that policing as a whole is something we can and want to live with. I look forward to the hearing from the other panelists and discussing this further. Thank you so much, Professor Harmon. Professor O'Chen. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, Professor Nadapop, and thank you, Professor Crespo, uh, for convening this uh, amazing series. Uh, I look forward to uh, attending some of the uh, later discussions. Um, and thank you so much for convening this amazing panel of uh, powerful uh, women. Uh, you know, it's, it's rare that you have a, a full panel of, uh, of women on, on these topics. And so I really appreciate the care with which uh, this panel was convened. And I appreciate hearing from uh, powerful voices like uh, uh, Congresswoman Bush uh, and Professor Harmon. I look forward to hearing from the DA a little bit later. Um, so what I want to talk about is uh, an intersectional analysis of the challenge of policing. And to start, I want to talk about uh, something that I've written about in the past, which is um, a collaboration between different um, uh, state entities in uh, a city called Lancaster uh, in the state of California. It's a suburb of Los Angeles. And for most of its history, it was almost exclusively white. It was known as, as a sundown town. Uh, but in the early 2000s, especially uh, as the housing market uh, imploded, uh, those uh, those demographics rea those demographic realities began to shift in quite rapidly. Uh, increasingly, poor Black and Latino families moved in, uh, pushed out of cities like Los Angeles due to exorbitant rents, and pulled to the suburbs uh, by the desire for uh, better quality of life and affordable housing. Many uh, were utilizing Section 8 vouchers to pay for their housing. Uh, in 2000, roughly around 2006, alarmed by the numbers of poor Black households. Uh, and Latinx households coming into their community, 
the city of uh, Lancaster, um, uh, uh, in collaboration with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, uh, the Lan Lancaster Department of Public Housing, the, the school district, and the Department of uh, Children and Family Services, convened a task force um, ostensibly to address the needs of people um, uh, who were coming into the community. Uh, but uh, in reality, it was to manage and regulate um, what was seen as a nuisance, uh, these families that were drawing from uh, public coffers uh, and putting burdens on uh, city resources. This task force was uh, uh, asked to identify, surveil, and in fact intimidated um, individuals in Section, Section 8 housing who were disproportionately Black women and their children. Uh, the this, members of this task force, particularly law enforcement, uh, followed women, followed these women as they took their children to school or as they went to work. Uh, teachers were contacted by DCFS and by law enforcement and asked about the attendance records of their children, uh, which were used to make allegations of criminal truancy, which could, uh, in some instances, land these women in jail uh, or result in hefty fines. Their homes uh, were searched. Uh, for Section 8 lease violations, which are non-criminal, but could result in the loss of their homes or uh, housing vouchers. Uh, the Department of Children and Family Services investigated their homes for abuse and neglect. And, and uh, quite strikingly, when these women called the police for help, uh, for example, for uh, domestic violence incidents, uh, these women were instead arrested uh, rather than their perpetrators, and their homes were searched again, looking for evidence of um, uh, an, an, an illegal occupant. Uh, I tell this story, which as I said, I examined in a piece called The New Racially Restrictive Covenant to say this. Uh, if we are to understand the expansive problems of policing, which uh, Congresswoman Bush described in which uh, Professor Harmon um, uh, articulated uh, in her comments, um, then we have to not just talk about traditional law enforcement. Not, we can't just talk about the police. We should view this moment, the uprisings and the reckoning uh, that the problems of policing uh, that gave rise to this moment through an intersectional lens that elevates the concerns of women like those who were targeted in the city of Lancaster. By that, I mean that we have to examine the ways in which marginalized identities uh, render individuals and communities vulnerable to state violence and to the multiple, and we also have to pay attention to the multiple institutions and systems that collide to produce these myriad forms of state violence. So when we hear um, communities, activists, uh, scholars calling for uh, defunding of police, uh, they're not just talking. They sh they're not just talking about police. And Miriam Kaba said this in a in a wonderful uh, op-ed in the New York Times. Right, we're talking about policing and the logics that uh, undergird it. Um, and when I say that, uh, and when I say that we need to look at an intersectional lens in terms of how we examine the problem of policing, um, it helps us to understand the ways in which uh, policing is gendered and racialized and affects women like those who were impacted in Lancaster. All too often when we think about policing, uh, we focus almost exclusively on traditional police departments and police practices such as stops, searches, uh, and use of force that target black and brown bodies and rely on racialized stereotypes of criminality uh, as justification. Um, this traditional view of policing and police violence posits uh, black men uh, and Latinx men uh, as the primary targets uh, and victims of policing, obscuring the ways in which uh, girls, women, and gender nonconforming people are subject to state surveillance, control, uh, and punishment. Um, this traditional view of policing in turn limits our ability uh, to create narratives around anti-Black -poli anti police violence uh, that women uh, and femmes experience uh, to develop advocacy strategies uh, to call attention to these dynamics and to draft policy interventions that address all of the ways that policing writ large harms Black and Brown communities. Um, so I want to just give a couple examples of uh, the way in which uh, this intersectional lens can help us to lift up uh, these expansive forms of policing and their racialized and gendered harms um, that uh, they inflict on Black communities and particularly Black women uh, and girls. Uh, so here's, here's a couple of examples. So if we talk about um, American policing, uh, race obviously is at the center of it, so is policing of gender and sexuality. Um, we talked about the experiences of women in Lancaster who were um, they followed uh, when they were taking their children to school, when they uh, attempted to uh, seek help as a result of uh, domestic incidents. And that's just the sort of tip of the iceberg. 
Um, uh, there have been a number of studies uh, conducted by the AEP as well as um, uh, a number of other uh, institutions, including the Bowling, State, uh, Bowling Green State University, that found that uh, the second most complained about form of police misconduct, when we're talking about tr traditional policing, is sexual violence. Um, uh, in a year-long investigation by the AP, they found that over 1,000 officers lost their badges in a six-year period uh, because of allegations of rape, sodomy, uh, or other sexual assault, and, and Daniel Holtzbaugh is one uh, example of that. Um, in the other study that Bowling Green conducted, roughly 405 uh, police officers were prosecuted uh, for rape, um, and another, were, uh, pro another 600 were prosecuted for uh, forcible fondling, for example. Um, but when we go beyond traditional policing institutions, we still see this happening, this policing of um, uh, gender, sexuality, the way in which um, Black women uh, uh, appear in their homes and attempt to care for their families. So in the context of welfare institutions. Uh, a case called uh, Sanchez versus uh, the County of San Diego authorized warrantless searches of the homes of individuals who were reliant on um, uh, public housing. Um, and this was done again by members of, of law enforcement. This was done by welfare investigators and um, information that was obtained during the course of those warrantless searches could result in uh, a criminal prosecution. Uh, surveil black women and, and other women of color encounter surveillance in hospitals and schools. Um, uh, been a number of cases of uh, black women being subject to arrest and prosecution for conduct during pregnancy. So we see all of these other sites uh, outside of the sort of traditional beat cop, outside of the traditional forms of law enforcement that cohere into uh, forms of policing um, that we also need to be talking about, that we also need to be addressing these logics of punishment that Sasha mentioned. Um, um, when we talk about governing through crime. So when we want to talk about dismantling um, the police or defunding the police or reforming the police, um, we have to be talking about policing and we have to look at how these logics appear um, in multiple institutions and the way in which they affect a diverse set of populations, including Black women and girls. And only when we can uh, liberate Black women and girls from these forms of surveillance policing, when we can liberate trans people and when we can limit, uh, liberate people who are disabled from these systems of surveillance and policing that occur across a broad swath of institutions, can we say that we have firmly dealt with the problem of policing in America? Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ochan, and welcome, DA Rollins. It's wonderful to see you again. Thank you for making it. We've explained to our audience uh, the sad reasons why you weren't able to join us right at the start. The hardest thing, hardest thing I've ever done in my life is getting onto this Zoom, but I made it, so I'm very happy. We're Thank so you. glad you're here. Thank you. The um, And you're here just in time, because we've just sort of uh, come to where we are uh, asking folks to share their opening remarks, and we're uh, 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 up to you. And the, the, the question that we put to the panel was just, you know, what should we as a country be learning from the killing of George Floyd and so many others? How should we understand this summer of protests we've just seen? And, and where, where do we take the institutions of policing, uh, given this potential crossroads we're standing at? And we'd love to hear your thoughts. And then we'll ask some questions of the group. Sure. Um, I think what many people are seeing with respect to the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, which of course we've now had two different iterations after that batch uh, there, is what many communities have been screaming for centuries, right? Um, I like to point out to people that where we find ourselves um, for cultural reference, this is why Colin Kaepernick silently took a knee and people lost their minds because he was silently protesting police brutality. Um, there was an amazing article in the Washington Post a few months back where it said, two knees, you have to choose one, either Colin Kaepernick's or Derek Chauvin's. You can't, you can't opt out. You must choose which one that you will support. Um, I think where we find ourselves is a moment of reckoning and a need for atonement and um, although the police are getting, uh, and I believe justifiably, and much of it, um, you know, taken to task with respect to some of this outrageous and murderous and felonious behavior, we have to look at district attorneys as well. When we think about an Ahmad Arbery, all of us have watched that video of a lynching, which, let's be very clear, the definition, yes, there was not a rope, 
uh, but that's not what the definition of lynching is. Um, and three district attorney's offices watch those video, watch that same video we've all seen of the McMichaels hunting um, Ahmad and then killing him. Uh, we now know the youngest McMichael, Travis, uttered a racial slur as Ahmad took his last breaths. Three district attorneys watched that video and said, looks fine, Georgia has a citizen's arrest statute. This seems clear, right? What I think where we find ourselves is many other communities are now recognizing that poor people and black and brown people overwhelmingly um, receive a very different police department than other people do, receive a very different criminal legal system than many others do. And as a progressive prosecutor myself, I think people are fearful that I want to pull the ceiling that they get to um, you know, walk in with the assumption of innocence and not guilt, uh, walk in with the belief that the system actually works. I want to drag that down to the floor of where poor black and brown people experience the system. And when they say that, they don't use those words. I say, but you're proving my point. There are two systems, right? I want to lift the floor to the ceiling. I want everyone to feel as though, because our tax dollars pay for it, and many individuals, immigrants, documented or undocumented, some at times paying taxes into our system, get a system that is failing them every day. And not just failing them, in some instances, killing them, right, with uh, impunity, uh, deporting them for matters that if, as an American, we wouldn't even potentially be looking at things. I have stood up and, and fought on behalf of individuals that had a misdemeanor, right, um, seven years ago that was going to be deported back to Somalia, where he spent two days of his life, the first two days of his life, then went to Saudi Arabia, and then ultimately came to the United States in his teens, um, was going to be deported back. So I, I think where we find ourselves, what we see with police um, and law enforcement, which of course includes ICE and federal agents, as well as state and local actors, is a moment of reckoning. And um, I am I am optimistic that this is cautiously optimistic that we are going to um, keep the pressure uh, on and you know make significant change uh, with respect to policing and you know I might not use the word defund but I support whatever words people are using because they're fed up and tired as well they should be um, and when we when we protest peacefully, nobody listens. When we take a knee quietly, nobody listens. So when we scream and yell or maybe break a window or um, engage in behavior with respect to property damage, our country values property more than they do our bodies, our black and brown and poor bodies. And they will point to that less than 1% of the masses that might engage in violence where insurance fixes those windows. Um, that building gets that property back. Um, George Floyd's family is never gonna see him again. Neither is Breonna Taylor or Elijah McClain's, et cetera. So we have to keep the pressure on. The unions, the police unions are fighting tooth and nail to change any situation that we have where there is gonna be more transparency, more oversight. They love the fact that they get to self-regulate um, and anyone who questions them gets labeled soft on crime, right? So we are in a, um, an incredibly unique situation, but I think, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to see some profound change. Thank you all so much for these uh, terrific sort of remarks that just set the table and set the, set the frame. Hopefully everyone at home now is able to see all of us. We're trying to sort of have the, 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 the Brady Bunch set up now because we're gonna move into some, some just discussion. Uh, and all of you who are sending in questions to the Q&A, thank you because we can read them here and we're trying to both sort of, you know, maybe we're, we're drawing on them and melding some of them together. So if we don't quite read out your name and your question, please know that we're also reading them and trying to sort of get as many into the conversation as we can. The, the, the first question here uh, is, to, uh, is to Ms. Bush. Uh, you know, I, hearing you speak, there was this, 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 this powerful language of activism animating your diagnosis. 
Uh, and then hearing Professor Harmon speak, there was this sort of, you know, uh, similar diagnosis in the language of sort of legislation, law, policy reform. And it occurs to me hearing her talk that you're kind of on the cusp of these two ways of looking at the problem. And I was reminded in thinking of that, of something that someone who, again, come January is very likely to be your colleague, the chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus, Representative Karen Bass, who was asked recently about some of the police reform legislation that is working its way through Congress. And one of the things she said in response was, it's the role of an activist to push us as far as they can push us. It's our role to legislate and that is a different role. I'm just kind of curious as someone who is in this sort of maybe transition moment in life or, or, uh, or is straddling these two worlds, do you see those roles as different? If so, how are they different? And what is it that you are hoping to you know, accomplish for all of these you know, ills you've talked about by, by making that move from where you have been uh, as you know, an organizer and an activist into the halls of Congress as, as a legislator? What are you most hoping to, to achieve by that? Most hoping to achieve you know, uh, just doing this thing different in our day. So, and the, it, you know, some things aren't happening just simply because somebody who has the vision to do it just hasn't done it yet, you know? Um, so I, I wanna get, take us from a place of thinking that we have to walk and do things within the confines of what we know or who did it before, or, you know, that, forget all of that. You know, what I saw on the streets of Ferguson was something that I never thought I'd see. And so, but what I also saw was how the, um, the entire world, the, just all over the world, people stood up and how many changes have happened across our country, even now, six years later, because people did something that they never thought they would do. And people did, people spoke up and stood up like uh, people said that they couldn't, you know, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that, but we did it and now we're here. So, um, I'm walking into the doors of of Congress, um, hopefully in January, as a politivist. Like I'm not going, you know, I'm being told I have to shave, kind of shave off the the rough edges of the activist and and all of that to come into these doors. But I push back on that and say I don't have to do that. I'm bringing the activist into Congress because this it's the reason why I want to go is because of what I've seen as an activist and because I've had to step into being an activist. Because if there was nothing there, I wouldn't have. To, I, I could be a nurse and a pastor somewhere. You know, I could be taking care of my. I'm a single parent. You know, me and my kids, me and my three. You know, like that could be me but instead there are all of these problems that continue to happen in our communities i remember at one point people kept saying to us oh you know you activists are so mean you're so mean you're so angry like where's your forgiveness you know you should be forgiveness like we need to move into a place of not just truth but reconciliation like when do we get to reconciliation and ah how do we get to reconciliation if you keep killing us? You know, and so we push truth for a long time and then we're talking so many groups right now are talking conciliation i got it but don't try to get me to a place of reconciling and forgiving when these things continue to occur. And so I'm walking into those doors, remembering what my face felt like when it hit the ground, when I was brutalized by the police, when they threw me in the air. I remember seeing the stars coming towards my face and then the ground coming towards my face. I couldn't, couldn't understand what was happening. Why am I seeing the stars? Didn't realize they had threw me up in the air. Um, and then just remembering how my face felt on the ground, on that hard concrete while, the, while I was being stomped by several police officers. Remembering every time I saw um, someone hung upside down and hog tied hanging off of, of a baton because they said no to an officer every time somebody stepped over off of a curb and just because they stepped off of the curb and you got near that white line you know in the street that meant you were impeding traffic so now you could be brutalized by the police I remember all of that and I won't forget it I won't forget what the rubber belts the rubber bullets felt like I won't forget the bear mace that burned my skin for 22 hours back on July the 5th this year you know I won't forget that and so I'm taking that in those doors because that voice has to be there as well Yes, I will work on policy because I remember what that burning felt like. Yes, I will remember every single person that was out there and the things that we went through, whether it was with the police or whether it was with the DA, whether it was with the judge, like we, we got to talk about the entire system. And so that is, that is how I'm going to, um, in, that will inform policy. If I, if I could add as an elected um, myself and you know, I wish I could vote in wherever you're running, Ms. Bush, because I would send two votes in. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I'm telling you, I used to say when everyone, when we talk about wealth-based disparities and race-based disparities, and people say to me as well, why don't you smile? Like, you're, you're always so angry. And I say, like, when do I smile? When I'm talking about um, 
you know, I don't know, somebody squeezing the life out of George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds? Does the smile come after that? Right? When does the smile come? None of this is funny, right? If white communities woke up and had, they went to sleep and then woke up the next day and all of their police officers were black and they beat the crap out of their kids or FIO'd them constantly or were harassing them on the way to school and pulling them over, you would have your congressman, your senator, your mayor, your city council, the governor, you'd be demanding justice immediately. That is what our lived experience is every single day. We are policed and over-policed and over-prosecuted in every aspect of our lives, right? And so for me, I like to say when people say, when do we get to reconciliation? I'm the oldest of five. And if I looked at my brother and slapped him dead in the face and then said, from this moment forward, we are going to have peace in this relationship. As his cheek was stinging, he'd say, wait, <laughs> so now we have peace? I don't get to, you know, and nobody's saying we need to swing back. But what you haven't even done is acknowledge the harm. We have a president right now that does not even want to acknowledge the 1619 project from the New York Times. This isn't, you know, an article that I'm writing in my home as some zealot. This is the New York Times that is doing this work. They don't even want to acknowledge the slavery, the redlining, the reconstruction, all of the, you know, Jim Crow era. They, they don't want to talk about it because it makes them uncomfortable. I think murder is Trump's uncomfortability every income. You get my point. I don't care about your uncomfortability or being comfortable if my people are still being murdered, maimed, and brutalized in 2020. So we need more people that are politivists. And I don't know whether I'm a district attorneyist, but I will tell you um, what I love about my job is the autonomy right? We need a Cori Bush. We have already, and we are lucky in Massachusetts, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, people that lead um, and, and are their true and full selves. But I agree with you. Don't ever forget those lived experience. That is what needs to be brought to our halls of Congress. I don't forget as the DA visiting my siblings who have been incarcerated, visiting my, my siblings who struggle with mental health issues or substance use disorder, being the guardian of two of my nieces as a result of that. I walk to work every day with that lived experience and try to lead with that lens, not just let's fling them all in jail and let the sheriff figure it out. Um, wow. <laughs> I want to invite Professor Ochen into this precise moment of the conversation. Um, and and uh, DA Rollins, you just mentioned the sheriff. Professor Ochen, you are on the oversight commission that oversees the LA County Sheriff's Department. Uh, and, and you are also deeply engaged in community activism in Los Angeles, and in many ways, you are straddling that same line that that so many on this panel are straddling. In your previous remarks, you mentioned something that I don't think that we appreciate enough, which is the kind of uh, the risk of impunity that we grant to police officers, not just on the job, but off the job. You mentioned the very high rates of domestic violence that police officers engage in, uh, high rates of sexual assault. And I, and I want to ask you to meditate on this question of the role of law when we see examples of law enforcement officials and, and perhaps if you want to talk about it, the sheriff's department that you oversee, um, uh, feeling that they have some ability to ignore the law and, and, and just ask you to, to, to join in this conversation at that space. Yeah, so, you know, part of what I've really been thinking about uh, in terms of my academic work, my activist work, and my policy work is uh, the efficacy of reform uh, and the efficacy of law in regulating and governing police departments, right? We see uh, policing as a basic social good, uh, as something that our uh, elected representatives at our government uh, has an obligation to provide to the public, right, to ensure that we are all safe uh, and secure in our communities. And that's effectuated by police uh, who also ensure the rule of law, right? That's a sort of traditional uh, story. 
Uh, and so when police uh, fall afoul of uh, our basic expectations of them by engaging in uh, um, you know, excessive use of force, by murdering people, uh, brutalizing people, lying, and so forth, uh, we often chalk that up because of how valorized law enforcement is to a few bad apples. Um, who can be reformed or rooted out by uh, policy reform, right? We can, we can appoint a civilian oversight body. We can eliminate uh, qualified immunity. Uh, we can change the use of force standards, which is what we've been doing here in California. Uh, we can uh, do any number of things to try to get uh, police more under control of, uh, uh, of, of, of their communities, uh, to ensure that police meet the basic expectations of professionalism, courtesy, um, kindness, uh, and, and law abidingness that we expect of them. Uh, and so we utilize these democratic reforms to try to reform police departments. And here's what I've learned uh, being on the Civilian Oversight Commission, uh, that these democratic reforms don't work and we become frustrated with them. Uh, we become angry, especially the communities who are directly impacted by them, Black and Latino communities, because we've been at this for decades, trying to reform uh, inherently violent and corrupt institutions. And why haven't we been able to reform the police despite decades and decades of trying, despite multiple reports, despite multiple commissions, uh, despite uh, generations of attention to this issue? And this is the conclusion I've come to. We can't fix the police with democratic reforms uh, through the use of and, and through the enactment of laws through the democratic process because the police are inherently anti-democratic. Uh, if you look at how they operate, uh, they routinely flout the law. If we are talking about uh, consent decrees that are imposed upon police departments, uh, they intimidate elected officials. Uh, you could look at the city of New York. Um, under Bill de Blasio when stop and frisk was uh, terminated, uh, the way that the police uh, unions uh, bullied and intimidated um, and attempted to intimidate uh, the mayor here in uh, California. We recently had an incident where the police union uh, ran ads um, with uh, a target on the back of an elected representative. Uh, they routinely lie uh, in court and on uh, official documents uh, where we expect um, uh, our uh, law enforcement entities, entities to tell the truth. Uh, they routinely flout um, directives from their elected officials. And that's the problem that we're having here in LA County. We have uh, been granted subpoena power, which we've used. Our sheriff has ignored it. Uh, we have asked the sheriff to cooperate with uh, our ex ex inspector general uh, in terms of uh, investigations of uh, police killings uh, uh, by, by members of the sheriff's department. We've been locked out. Uh, we have asked the sheriff to provide just basic information about who's in our jails. And we have one of the largest jail systems uh, in the world. We have been rebuffed. Um, our sheriff has called uh, a Latina member of our board of supervisors, which funds the sheriff's department, uh, a racial slur. Um, why? Because he knows he can act with impunity and that there will be no one to essentially check him um, uh, aside from the voters every four years. And even then, uh, those elections have very low turnout and our sheriffs uh, essentially can't be checked by any other Democratic uh, body. So time and time again, we turn to the law, uh, we turn to the democratic process to try to uh, affect change within uh, violent uh, um, uh, law enforcement institutions and we fail. Uh, precisely because uh, law enforcement simply flouts these democratic initiatives um, and asserts their own rules, their own culture uh, on the public um, with uh, tremendous harms in the way that uh, Professor uh, Harmon uh, described. I, I think this tees up for me what is a, a, a directly goes into a question I have for, for D.A. Rollins. Because, in you know, D.A. Rollins, you live between two worlds also, but of a different sort of sort, right? You know, you have, you know, we've just heard from Professor O'Chan about the enormous power of police uh, unions, police institutions. We're going to have an entire session in this lecture series on police unions. But, you know, when she, when Professor O'Chan talks about uh, criticizing or intimidated elected officials, I mean, you know, a few days before you were sworn in, the National Police Association filed a bar complaint against you. You've had, you've had public confrontations with police unions locally and nationally. And yet at the same time, you know, I was listening to you on WBUR just recently, you know, talking about how the vast majority of police are doing a good job and that it's a problem of the kind of focus on bad apples. And obviously you have to work with police officers every day. So, to, you know, to, I, I hear you speaking in sort of both, both senses here, you know, a focus on the police as ally and as partner and as the essential other arm of the law enforcement team that you lead. 
And yet at the same time also, as groups, groups that have criticized you and taken steps against you as an elected official that are in some ways unprecedented. So I'm just curious how you think of that question of the power of organized policing or in police institutions as someone who's interacting with that institution in really two different ways with some potential tension between them. Yeah, and again, I mean, if anyone who's ever handled fruit or knows what a bad apple looks or feels like, it's disgusting. It's, it's, it's infecting all the other fruit in that bowl. There are fruit flies everywhere. So this is not just one or two bad apples. I like to say if there are 10 bad police officers and 1,000 good police officers who say nothing about the 10 bad, we have 1,010 bad police officers, right? That's why there are now bystander requirements that we've seen as a result of things where you can't willfully look the other way, where we have seen abject failures regarding IAD, which is Internal Affairs Division, and ACD. These are the words we use in Massachusetts. I don't know what you guys use in the states that you're in, which is Anti-Corruption Division. Um, that's the criminal as opposed to the procedural or administrative violations. It's become very clear to me that the DA's office that I inherited um, just about a year and a half ago had no oversight on that. At the end of a process, they might spit something out and say, here you go, DA, we think this is a crime. Well, that doesn't help me if you hand me two small things. Is that two of 12 things you looked at? Is that two of a thousand things you looked at? If you're talking about $300 worth of overtime fraud, but when I go into the community, I'm hearing about brutalization of people by certain units in our police department, that's excessive use of force as opposed to a, you know, like written rules violation. Um, I think we have to be far better as DAs, right, looking at the police. And why I think they were most upset with me is they, of course, had put all of their money and power and privilege behind a candidate in the race who I can happily say came in second. And so I owed no, nobody anything as the elected candidate. And I had made clear to them, we aren't friends. I don't report to you and you don't report to me, but the difference between our role is when you break the law, just like anyone else, I'm holding you accountable, period, end of story. And in fact, because we have to work together, if I don't hold you accountable, the system, which I believe and know is operating just the way it was supposed to, it's not broken, it is working just the way it was set up to work, right? But people lose faith if they say, wait a minute, Massachusetts, you have now no less than six or seven state police scandals. Um, these troopers who have stolen tens and tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in overtime fraud, get to retire with dignity, accept their pension, and maybe get some slap on the wrist in Florida, where they live now. But if I shoplift $200 worth of stuff because I'm starving, and need food from a supermarket or Target, they're gonna want me to charge them with some crime and put them in jail. It's hypocrisy, right? It's complete hypocrisy. Um, and the, the thing I will just double down on is the unions have the power to label elect, elected officials as soft on crime. They're unlike any other unions we have. This isn't the teacher's union. This isn't the you know nurse's union, right? The, the police have the lethal and legal authority to kill you, kill you with no oversight. They don't have to stop and make a phone call. And what I like to tell them, and it's my job afterwards to see if that was reasonable and justified or not. So I'm proud that before these reforms were demanded, and I know communities demanded it way before George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and others, but nobody was really listening. Um, I created what is the first in the nation discharge integrity team, where my office doesn't even investigate officer involved shootings. I do, right? Outside of my office, I have a, re a community member, a retired criminal or retired judge, a criminal defense lawyer, and an active member of law enforcement, and I'm the fifth member. I only have one, two, or three people in my office that present to us, we don't meet in our office, we meet monthly and we meet with the community and we discuss with them what we are doing so that they have at least a sliver of faith in the system as opposed to these officer involved shootings happen, 
They go to the DEA's office. They don't hear anything for years. And then quietly they say, yeah, reasonable, justified, not a big deal. And I will end with Black communities overwhelmingly and, and, and brown in some circumstances, we fail in both realms. We never get the criminal prosecution that we are entitled to when we are murdered. And we're, of course, blamed for our murder. We're the only group of people, most culturally appropriated group of people on the planet Earth, who are then blamed for our murder. But above and beyond that, we now, with qualified immunity, we don't even get the ability to get a dime as a result of this behavior in certain circumstances, um, where that is the other place that not only does that person go to jail for murder, but then the, the city has to pay the millions of dollars out to that family, which of course doesn't fill the hole in the void of the loss, but at least can get them some sort of accountability. Thank you. Uh Professor Harmon, I want to join up a thread. Uh, D.A. Rollins mentioned this challenge of maintaining the legitimacy of the criminal process that we have. And you mentioned in your remarks, uh, what I think, uh, 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 the insight that the people do not wait for the legal system anymore. They, go, they, they enter the streets as soon as the injustice occurs. We, and, and I took you to be implying, or maybe not implying, uh, that it's a reflection of, some, of a loss of faith, that, that we don't need to wait anymore. We, we, we have no faith that the outcome will vindicate those interests. And I, I think that's such a powerful point. And it's a particularly powerful coming from you because you have spent your career grappling with the law. Um, we, uh, Professor Harmon and I both serve uh, I as, as an advisor to the, the, the the project that she is an associate reporter for the American Law Institute attempting to articulate what principles of policing should look like under the law. And I just wanted to invite you to, to join this, this theme that we are hearing emerging from this panel on the, on the role of law, its, its limitations, what, what can we do to render what, are, what is our ability to render it legitimate? We are, we are after all, at a law school speaking to uh, dozens of people who are entering the legal profession. What can we say to them about the possibilities and the limits of the law in this space? Um, well, I'm happy to continue to listen to these three brilliant and powerful African-American women. So I don't need to say anything. But if I'm gonna say something about the law, I would say, that you know, one of the reasons I left the Justice Department is because I thought, well, prosecuting police officers can't possibly be the way to solve the problem. But that, but you know, when you look at people marching in the street demanding those prosecutions, I started to have to pay more attention to the idea that even though they didn't solve the problems, one of the things the victims told me is that it was the first time in their lives when I said, look, I'm from the Justice Department, what happened to you was wrong and I'm gonna do something about it, they felt like that was a sign of respect from the government. And so, you know, prosecution, civil damages, this is not enough. This isn't close to enough, but it doesn't mean it's not important. It is a sign of the government's respect for individuals. And so we need to continue to refine um, and, and improve the laws we have uh, governing police conduct and the methods we have for holding police accountable. But at the same time, we have to use law for the bigger mission. And you can see this in D.A. Rollins' um, reforms, that you, you both have to focus on the, on the system as a whole, on what it's achieving, whatever its intent is, whatever its, um, whatever its individual incidents might seem to justify, what it, it, what it is doing to people um, who it's actually affecting. And to do that, you have to hear from those voices, which is why Congress members Bush's election is so important. It's, it's bringing into the, uh, the lawmaking process the voice of people who know the effects the system is having on people on the street. And so I think the law plays multiple roles. I don't think accountability is unimportant. Um, I don't think the rules governing this, the, the, what police should do are unimportant. I don't think the structure of political uh, systems which allow the voices to get heard are unimportant. But I think we have to, on top of that, think about the tools that we have um, to, to improve outcomes um, more broadly. Professor Harmon, you know, when you speak of the importance of, of voice here, I, I'm, 
I see a theme in probably five or six of the questions that have come in that actually focus a lot on the the language of this moment, right? So much of this moment is marked by by phrases that we hear, right? You know, um, defund the police. On the other hand, back the blue. You know, there's 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 this language that comes of all of this, and a bunch of people are sort of asking about um, how people who are in the you know activism space or the space that is sort of generating these moment defining uh, phrases, how you navigate the tension between trying to appeal to people who don't agree with you uh, and maybe win over people who don't agree with you on the one hand without giving up the, 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 the centrality and the urgency that we're seeing on this panel. But a lot of folks have been asking in the Q&A about, for example, the phrase defund the police. You know, on the one hand, they think, gosh, this feels like maybe it's a, a hazy phrase, right? On the one hand, some folks are saying, gosh, it feels almost inherently conservative. It's about sort of, you know, just taking a little bit of money away or taking some money away and repurposing it to other state agencies. On the other hand, we see in, the, in our national media that defund the police is described more frequently than not as a kind of fully radical idea. I'm just kind of curious, as, as those of you try to navigate the politics of this, how you think through this question of, are you trying to persuade people who disagree with you? And what do you do if some of the, the ways that we go about this, you know, put, put people off. We have a comment from, from, from a student who says, you know, honestly, I have a lot of police officers in my family. And when I hear things spoken about some of these ways, my instinctive reaction, this person says, is to feel defensive and on guard and like I, like, like I you know, not, not trusting. And it's, maybe it's an inherent, an inherent tension, but I'd, I'd love to just hear those of you who give so much thought to the, the dynamics of this, talk about that. I see you uh, uh, signaling me, uh, Congresswoman Bush, please. Yeah, so that feeling that that person, that that student just spoke about, that's how we feel every day just in life. So hearing about what happened, what, hearing about what that thing that's making you uncomfortable when, when people say these things about police, that's how we feel every single day. And we can't even just say walking out of our home. Brianna was murdered in her bed. You know, so we can't just say that we can't. Uh, Tatiana Jefferson wasn't murdered outside of her home. She was in her home, you know, so that's how we feel. So I, I you know, I, I understand that that thing makes you uncomfortable, but it makes you uncomfortable. The thought of something, the hearing some words makes you uncomfortable. But we're talking about our lives are on the line. So I'm asking you to push in a little further and think about what it's like for people who only this is the thing. There is a physical reaction that people have when they see my skin. A physical reaction, a negative reaction happens in their bodies. And so then that comes out some way, either in their, in their actions, in their verb, uh, verbally, or it comes out some other way later. We're talking about stopping that. So when we say defund, I'm sorry if the language makes you uncomfortable. And I'm not trying to be ignorant or, or, or anything like that. But when we say defund, it made you think. Because let me say this, when education was defunded, did anybody say anything? Education has been defunded for a long time. We've been moving money from the, the um, education, education system, putting it into private prisons for a long time, and nobody is saying anything about that. But when we say defund the police, because the police have to be this treasure, look, we want money to go to places that are underfunded. So do I want money to go from MRAPs? If an MRAP is $300,000, my community could probably use, our, uh, use that money for our unhoused population. We could have used that money to bring COVID-19 supplies quicker into our communities, but that didn't happen. We could use that money um, to, uh, to pay our health, uh, our uh, mental health professionals. We can, instead of having our police be mental health professionals, instead of having our police be social workers, let's have them do what they're supposed to do and then, use the, and then have the people who have gone to school to do these things let them be paid to do that job because let's be, let's face this uh social workers aren't even paid the wage that they deserve uh, but we won't even go into all of that um you know i think about as a nurse people you know um the amazing da rollins boy huh, um you know um speaking and brought up the was talking about the bad good the bad officers and the good officers you know i think it was chris rock that said you know can we have like it's like can we pilots. have bad pilots you know, right? Can you have the bad pilots? Like, who wants the bad pilot? Uh, who wants the bad chef at the chef of the restaurant? Yeah, come on in. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. But sit on down. You know, no, we can't have good officers and bad officers. There needs to. There should be officers and then extraordinary officers, the ones that get the medals. That's that should be the, That should be all that we have. Because I think about it as a nurse working in a hospital. Look, when I'm at the hospital. 
I, you know, I, and I have my staff. If I have a staff member that continues to murder people because this this nurse can't can't figure out a uh, hundred units of insulin to give to this person versus a hundred milligrams, you know, of of insulin to give to this person, and how much, you know, and this person, this nurse is always killing folks, or this person is always hurting people. And then I say, well, you know what? We got to keep that amongst us. You know, we're going to, you know, just do better next time. Tell the kids I said hello. Is that what you expect from me? When you show up to that hospital, you expect the quality care that nurses bring in the end. If a nurse does something wrong, it makes the paper. Like it goes into the nurses, the, you know, the, the, the state sends out a paper, the, nur the nurses, um, uh, send out a paper every month that says, and it has a, por a portion in there where it says, this nurse, such and such by name, this nurse did this, and this is what happened when the investigation happened. Just because, just because we turned it in and said, this nurse did this. It goes somewhere, and that information is made public. So we're holding, we're holding even nurses to a standard that police officers aren't being held to. And so I have to push back on the comfortability of people, you know, and how things make you feel, and what labels make you feel like, if, if saying defund made you stand up and say, oh, you know, something is wrong with this, you paid attention. And look, I'm asking you to not be upset when you have your foot, you, you, when you have your foot, you're stepping on my foot and I say, you know what, get off my foot and you don't do anything. Hey, you know what, would you move? Get off my foot and you don't do anything. But when I push you off my foot and now you want to say, oh, why are you pushing me? Why are you getting mad? You can't do that. No, you should have moved the first time or you shouldn't have even been there. That's what we're saying. So it's not about your comfort comfortability, if I'm making the word up. It's not about your comfortability. It's about what's right for all people. If I could jump in, I mean, to her point, my mom's a registered nurse. The reason why it makes the paper is because she's licensed, just like lawyers are. Yes. And many police officers aren't, right? And right. I, as a lawyer, you know, we don't have the death penalty in Massachusetts, but um, I can't kill you with my pen, right? Writing something or I can make, you know, enormous changes in people's lives, right? With the decisions I make in the autonomy, but police officers have the legal and lethal authority to kill. Um, and that, you know, they aren't licensed, at least in Massachusetts, uh, they are not. And we're hopefully moving toward that. Budgets are a value statement. Budgets are a value statement. And when we in Massachusetts or Boston have a $414 million budget for the Boston Police Department, and then somewhere else, $60 million in overtime, you shouldn't have to have a Nobel Peace Prize in economics to read a budget of a city, right? It should just be like police budget, all the stuff should be there and it should be explained, right? And that's four times as much money as the Boston Public Health Commission makes, right? When we think about education in prisons, and I testified in front of our legislature and said, when we were asking for $17,000 more per student in rural poor schools and urban uh, poor schools, to say, let's be on, you know, we'll be, we want to be equal with some of these more wealthy communities where their taxes allow the public school systems to be better. I was peppered and drilled with questions. And I said, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. I was just here a couple months ago and we pay $55,000 a year for a prisoner at Nashua Street uh, Jail. And you didn't ask me a single question. You don't care about the end of the system where it's three times as much money to pay for a prisoner, which by the way, two to three prisoners, every two to three prisoners, one correction officer. That's the ratio there. In our schools, it's 28 students to one teacher. And we're, we're, we're hemming and hawing about 15 to $17,000. Our system is, is, um, is set up for failure. And I can tell you as the DA, one of the best indicators as to whether or not you will touch the criminal legal system, not the only, but is are you getting a quality education? right? What is your housing situation? Are, are you suffering from environmental racism, which is very real and higher levels of COPD and asthma because you live in a place where there are bridges and roads going through every, everywhere and, and you are, um, you know, toxins and emissions are significantly higher in your community. I will just also point out that when our, when our government you know, when Jeff's Attorney General Jeff Sessions cut all the consent decrees and there was no longer any oversight on all of these rogue police departments, nobody questioned like, you know, the defunding 
right, of that, right? The regulation, they're like, oh, this is wonderful. He's fiscally responsible, right? Um, but it resulted in more harm to our communities. Um, and then as far as protesters, it's part of why when I hear the professor talk about, and I love this, people don't wait for the criminal legal system anymore, they take to the streets. You're right, that same criminal legal system that allowed Derek Chauvin to have 17 infractions and didn't do anything that is now gonna investigate Derek Chauvin for the homicide of George Floyd and the DA's office that didn't look into Derek and prosecute him if any of those were crimes. Absolutely right, they should be outraged and out there. And it's why I've said, I believe in the First Amendment, and unless there is violence, and I don't mean disrespect or loud language or stepping off of a curb, I mean violence and, and, and you know, significant harm, we are not going to be prosecuting protesters in Boston. So I, I wish we could go on um, for many more hours. We are out of time. I'm going to exercise moderator privilege because we stopped. We started five minutes late, so I'm going to ask everyone to stay one, uh, a couple minutes more. I, I would love to give our extraordinary panelists one last minute to say a few parting words to, uh, to our students, to this group. Um, DA Rollins, uh, if, if we could start with you, and then we'll, I'll ask Professor Harmon and then Pro Professor O'Chen, and then we'll give Congresswoman Bush the last word. Uh, anything you would like to leave our our students and our community with? Yeah, just that I think that there's this false dichotomy where it's police reform, but what about black on black crime? Or, you know, it, if you harm the police, a police officer, people say, but what about black, you know, what about police brutality? I think we can, we can believe black lives matter and also um, want to, make sure that police officers aren't harmed, right? We look at what happened in LA with these two deputy sheriffs. I'm praying for their recovery. And I will say that out loud, of course I will. We, we, we oppose violence, period. We're not saying we want white people to experience the same thing that we do every day. We don't want violence at all. We just want it acknowledged that it's happening at an incredibly disparate rate for us. So I will say, I think there's a false dichotomy that's out there. I do think it's important that we continue, maybe not trying to persuade, but speaking to people that we disagree with. We have to start having very uncomfortable conversations, um, period, end of story. And to the, the, the Congresswoman's point, um, you're, you know, uncomfort and like maiming or murder, your uncomfort, uh, you can deal with that, I promise you. <laughs> Being a little bit of uncomfortable because you heard some words that hurt your feelings, and I'm not belittling that, but as opposed to the George Floyd family, uh, your uncomfort is, I'm sorry for that, let's, let's keep it moving and speed up a little bit, right? Because our uncomfort is that's just, you know, the level I wake up with every day, right? And, and the assumptions that are made about me as a visibly brown and black woman, right? So I will say, be involved, even if you disagree with what I'm saying, and if this is at Harvard Law School or people are local, let's engage in a conversation. Um, not a, you know, or a debate, you know, that's fine, but let's start a conversation if we disagree, because where we are is harming too many people, and we need to start moving forward in the process. And then I'm just honored to be with these amazing two professors and this um, woman, so Wesley Bell and, and um, Kim Gardner are my two good friends, so you know I'm texting them about it now in, in Missouri. All right, but thank you for having me. I'll just take the opportunity to, to mention that our next, that Wesley Bell will be at our next session on October 16th. So I hope everybody will remember to, to, to join us again for, for future extraordinary sessions. Um, Professor Herman. I guess, you know, it, police can and do play a really important role in making people, um, making communities safer and making them more livable. But they don't play that role in every community. And until they do, we're going to have to talk about the harms the police do, as well as the benefits that they uh, can bring. And so, yes, there are hard conversations to be had, but that doesn't um, uh, really shouldn't be taken um, as a lack of faith in what policing can achieve in the United States. Professor O'Chen. 
So I would say that this is a movement, not a moment. So for many, this, uh, the, the uprisings in cities across the country seems quite sudden. Uh, but when we look at the historical record, uh, this reckoning has been decades um, or centuries even in the making in terms of even when the first police departments were founded to regulate labor in the North and to regulate unpaid labor, i.e. enslaved people um, in the South. Um, so this has been a long time coming in terms of trying to uh, align policing with our democratic norms, our democratic expectations, um, our anti-discrimination norms, um, uh, broadly. Uh, and, and what produced this moment is an abject failure on all of those counts in terms of regulating police departments along the lines of democracy, along the lines of equality, along the lines of ensuring that people can live with dignity in their communities, notwithstanding their race, gender, sexual orientation, uh, disability, and so forth. And so the work that's been done over the decades is significant, um, and it has helped us to understand the true nature of uh, the problem that we're addressing. So it's not just with regard to police departments, it's with regard to our political systems, it's regard, with regard to our civil institutions that perpetuate um, uh, the logics of policing. So when, when folks say defund the police, what they're talking about is not merely shifting resources, right? Uh, they're talking about uh, bankrupting a particular kind of ideology that views police uh, as the front line of segregation, that views police as a mechanism for regulating the poor, uh, the racially uh, marginalized, and those who are differently able, those who are not normative. Uh, and so that's really the question in terms of what are we defunding? We're not only shifting the resources that fund police, but the ideologies that undergird them. And those ideologies exist in a number of institutions outside of law enforcement, uh, traditional law enforcement agencies, as I was um, uh, discussing. So if we're going to divest from police, we cannot simultaneously reinvest in other punitive institutions. So we really have to pay attention to those logics. That work is there. It's decades long. And at this moment, folks are being called in not called out. They're being called in to be allies. Uh, and that includes law students and law professors. We have a lot of work uh, to do to really question the role that we play in facilitating um, uh, police violence and in legitimizing uh, policing in the way that it, uh, it has been exercised in uh, the United States. And we need to be partners in really dismantling uh, the uh, ideological underpinning of policing in the United States and the way it affects um, those who are the most vulnerable in our communities. And I hope that the folks who are uh, watching this uh, will uh, uh, take that invitation and will join us uh, in asking these critical questions about the role of law and democracy uh, in regulating um, public safety and what public safety means uh, more generally. And I'll just take this moment to remind everyone that there are supp some supplemental readings from some of our uh, academic colleagues on the website if you're interested in reading more deeply about these issues. Congresswoman Bush, can you send us off? Absolutely. Um, just want to ask a question just for people to think about later on as you go through your day and hopefully um, that you can kind of mull over over the next few weeks, you know, thinking about this subject and what is your anti-racism work and how does that plug into what we've been talking about today? You know, we're always told, you know, we'll kind of get past this or if you all will comply and, and all of these things and, you know, but, but then I think about how in 2015, one year, year after Michael Brown was murdered and we had protested for more than 400, 400 days um, with the Ferguson uprising and, you know, and we ended up with a Blue Lives Matter law. We ended up with 70% uh, of uh, black drivers were more likely, um, black drivers were 70% more likely to be pulled over in Missouri than white drivers. Now, in 2019, we were 95 percent more likely to be pulled over um, by police officers than white drivers in a state where we're only 11.8 percent, where um, the uh, uh, white drivers, uh, the white community is 83 percent in this country, in this state. Um, where our Latinx and Hispanic community is 4.3%. We were 95% more likely to be pulled over, 40% more likely to be um, uh, stopped and searched, and 40% more likely to be arrested, even though we were the ones that didn't have the, uh, a lot of times didn't have anything on us when we were searched. So what is your anti-racism work and how can you use that to help fix this problem? And I'm saying that because everybody has a place. I don't care if you're a student, I don't care what your place is right now. There is a work that you can do. Take it to your 
families, to your network, take it to your, if you have a religious affiliation, if you have, you know, whatever groups you're a part of, take it to the boardroom, take it to wherever, whatever access you have, use that and put it to this work because that's the only way we'll change it. And if you think that if you're not a part of, if there is something that you cannot bring, you haven't dug deep enough. So go back and look at this thing. Every single person has a, ha, has a place in this to fix this, fix this in this country for all of us. Because this is, because if I die tomorrow, if I'm murdered tomorrow, can you say that you did the work to make sure that Black Lives Matter? Thank you. Thank you. We have to thank our extraordinary panel. Uh, this has been um, illuminating and inspiring. Uh, I'll turn it over to Professor Crespo if you'd like to uh, leave us with any few words. Thank all. I'd like to thank all the students and all our participants who listened. Um, and I hope everybody uh, appreciates the time that these extraordinarily busy and overcommitted people, they, none of these panelists have any time and they donated that time today to us so that we could do our work better, so that we could proceed in our education better. So thank you, we're very, very grateful. Thank you all so, so much. Echoing the DA and the future Congresswoman, as the DA said, part of the work is having a conversation. Certainly not all of the work, but that's what we're hoping to do here, to have this type of conversation, to have it last a full year, uh, and to put in the time that we can to make sure that we explore these questions as thoroughly and as thoughtfully, but with the urgency that the moment calls for. Uh, and you know, many of your questions in the chat, as I was reading through them, I thought, okay, well, we've got a whole session on that, which is why those questions might not have been asked today. But we hope that you'll go to policinginamerica.law.harvard.edu. You can see the full slate of topics we're gonna talk about. You can see our future panelists. And we look forward to seeing many of you back here in October. And to our amazing panelists, one more time, I'll just say thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us.